This is Bishop Gregory Brewer's homily, January 30th, 2014, in Orlando, Florida. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, the Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. A very long time ago, actually, I was rector here in Orlando, New Covenant, and I was meeting with other pastors in the city, it was an interdenominational group, because we were praying and planning together as this city was just exploding with growth. What was missing? What did the city need? And one of the things we knew that the city needed was a place for runaways, because a lot of people at that time had this sort of, oh, I can just leave all my troubles in Jersey City or in Canton, Ohio, and come down and get a job at Disney. And of course, that didn't work out. And more often than not, they, came, they wound up becoming victims on the streets, uh, prostitutes, homeless people, things like that. And so a couple of friends of mine and I started looking at other models for how we might deal with that and ended up at Covenant House in New York City, a place that is a house for runaways. We spent almost two days there meeting and talking with various people. And the whole time I was there, I kept thinking, I'm not seeing the whole picture. What's missing? And then finally, literally the second day, we walked into a room, actually a rather large room, where there was a group of people and their whole focus at Covenant House was to pray for Covenant House. It was almost like this monastic community. It was a group of people who saw and who had as their job description intercession. That's what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to pray for the people at Covenant House, for the people who were coming in, the intake officers, all this, because it was an enormous operation. And, and when I started talking to them, and the way they met together, and the way they prayed, it was like, ah, this is the heart of this operation. That's the piece for me that was missing. It wasn't just all of this big, glorious machinery. There was a, there was a heart in it, and it was the fruit of this group of people's intercession. In many ways, the Old Testament lesson today from Samuel offers us the same kind of picture. Here you have King David in all of his glorious greatness at this point in his life. And it's as if what happens is that we're allowed, not just all this picture of his magnificence, but we get, the curtain gets pulled back. <coughs> and we see David in prayer and his attitude in prayer, the way he approaches prayer, and therefore the way he views God and, as a result, the way he views himself. And if there's anything that's a key to the life of David, it's his prayer life. And who the man was when nobody else, in essence, was looking. The context, of course, is, if you look at the previous <coughs> chapter, Nathan, the prophet, has received a word from God. And the word from God <coughs> for David is basically this. I've taken you out of nothing. Do you remember, David? You were the least of all of your brothers. You were out there tending sheep, which is not a glorious job ever. And yet, I had my finger on you, not your elder brothers. And I'm the, I'm the one who, in essence, raised you up out of nothing, really, into a position of basically being the most important man in all of Israel. That was my doing. It wasn't yours. And I'm not done with you yet. My commitment to you is to li literally establish your lineage. More is going to come through you than anything you could ever imagine. And which is why we get the echo in the psalm that actually becomes a messianic promise. A son, the fruit of your body, I will establish on your throne forever. Remember, Jesus is from the house and lineage of David. All of that is contained in God's promise through Nathan to David. And what we get in the scripture lesson this morning is David's response to Nathan's word, God's promises to him. And it's worth noting how what he does, 
Then King David went in and sat before the Lord. He goes into the temple. He's not standing in a position of prayer. He's literally sitting in a place of profound humility. Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me thus far? It was a small thing in your eyes that you did it. Of course, you can do anything that you want. But you still did it. You did it as a word to me. And all that pours out of him is a winsome and really lovely sense of both gratitude and profound humility. David realizes that all of the things that have happened in his life are really not, in fact, the fruit of his accomplishments. Yes, David was gifted. David was brilliant. He came from an extraordinarily notable family, in fact. A lot of privilege was his, but none of that, in fact, allowed him to step into the place of leadership that he did without mercy, without God's choosing him and raising him up. And he understands that it is to that that he owes all of the success of his life and ministry. It wasn't just that he tried hard. It was that God opened doors for him that he could have never opened for himself. God was the one that said no, Guess what? There's somebody not at the banquet, and it's the young son. Go get it, Jesse, his father. That didn't have to happen. That was all by God's direction. <clears throat> and so he understands, and so what he does is that he sits before the Lord in humility. He, in essence, says, I have, I have nothing to offer you except myself, and it's not much. But use me. Use me. Let the promises that you've prayed really be true. Help me to become the king that you've called me to be. Allow me to lead in such a way as that my son sit on the throne. Allow Israel, whom you've chosen as your possession, to flourish. In other words, what he does is that he takes God's word to Nathan as the promises on which he offers his prayer. All of which is, I don't qualify for this at all. But you've promised it, God, so please, you do it. That's an extraordinarily helpful model for us. Because all of those things are actually true for us. That if God is to use us effectively in ministry especially, we come in the same position. Right. Who am I that you would want to use me? You know me better than I know myself. And if there's anything, that, and if there's anyone in the universe who would know that I don't qualify, um, it's you. And yet, you've chosen to use me. And it is, in fact, by your mercy that it happens. And because you promised, through your son, to be with me forever, to empower me for ministry, to open doors for me that I can never open for myself, all I can do is say, based on your promises, not my merit, by any stretch of the imagination, do what it is that you promised and help me to live according to your will. That's what David is saying, you see. And therefore, because in the end, remember the prayer that we prayed at the very beginning? It's the collect for Epiphany 3. That the whole world may perceive and know the glory of your marvelous works. What is the glory of his marvelous works? It's in fact a human being that has been changed by God's mercy, who knows nothing but humility and gratitude because all that they have received, they don't qualify for in any way, shape, or form, and yet God in his love chooses to pour it out anyway and use normal, broken people, just like us, to actually make a difference in the world, to actually touch something that God desires to see happen for the sake of his kingdom. There's no privilege higher than that, nor is there any talent that equips us for that. That has to be God's work. And so like David, we learn from him, you see, and say, who am I? But Lord, do what you've promised. Amen. Amen.